Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, Chapter 12 The Triwizard Tournament Through the gates flanked with statues of winged boars, and up the sweeping drive the carriages trundled, swaying dangerously in what was fast becoming a gale. Leaning against the window, Harry could see Hogwarts coming nearer, its many lighted windows blurred and shimmering behind the thick, behind the thick curtain of rain. Lightning flashed across the sky as their carriage came to a halt before the great oak front doors, which stood at the top of a flight of stone steps. People who had occupied the carriages in front were already hurrying up the stone steps into the castle. Harry, Ron, Hermione and Neville jumped down from their carriage and dashed up the steps too. Looking up only when they were safely inside the cavernous torch-lit entrance hall, with its magnificent marble staircase. Blimey, said Ron, shaking his head and sending water everywhere. If that keeps up, the lake's going to overflow. I'm soaked. Ah! A large red water-filled balloon had dropped from out of the ceiling onto Ron's head and exploded. Drenched and spluttering, Ron staggered sideways into Harry. Just as a second water bomb dropped, narrowly missing Hermione, it burst at Harry's feet, sending a wave of cold water over his trainers into his socks. People all around them shrieked and started pushing each other in their efforts to get out of the line of fire. Harry looked up and saw, floating twenty feet above them, Peeves the poltergeist, a little man in a bell-covered hat and orange bow tie, his wide malicious face contorted with concentration as he took aim again. Peeves! yelled an angry voice. Peeves, come down here at once! Professor McGonagall, deputy headmistress and head of Gryffindor House, had come dashing out of the Great Hall. She skidded on the wet floor and grabbed Hermione around the neck to stop herself falling. Ouch! Sorry, Miss Granger. That's all right, Professor, Hermione gasped massaging her throat. Peeps, get down here now! barked Professor McGonagall, straightening her pointed hat and glaring upwards through her square-rimmed spectacles. Not doing nothing, cackled Peeps, lobbing a water bomb at several fifth-year girls who screamed and dived into the grey hall. Already wet, aren't they, little squirts? Whee! and he aimed another bomb at a group of second years who had just arrived. I shall call the headmaster, shouted Professor McGonagall. I am warning you, Peeves. Peeves stuck out his tongue and threw the last of his water bombs in the air, into the air and zoomed off up the marble staircase, cackling insanely. Well, move along then, said Professor McGonagall sharply to the bedraggled crowd. Into the Great Hall, come on! Harry, Ron and Hermione slipped and slid across the entrance hall and through the double doors on the right, Ron muttering furiously under his breath as he pushed his sopping hair out of his face. The Great Hall looked his usual splendid self, decorated for the starter term feast, Golden plates and goblets gleamed by the light of hundreds and hundreds of candles. Floating over the tables in mid-air, the four long house tables were packed with chattering students at the top of the hall. At the top of the hall, the staff sat along one side of a fifth table, facing their pupils. It was much warmer in here. Harry, Ron and Hermione walked past the Slytherins, the Ravenclaws and the Hufflepuffs, and sat down with the rest of the Gryffindors at the far side of the hall, next to nearly headless Nick, the Gryffindor ghost. Pearly white and semi-transparent, Nick was dressed tonight in his usual doublet with a particularly large ruff, which served, as, which served the dual purpose of looking extra festive and ensuring that his head didn't wobble too much on his particularly, uh, uh, sorry, on his partially severed neck, severed neck, 
Good evening, he said, beaming at them. Says who? said Harry, taking off his trainers and emptying them of water. I hope they hurry up with the sorting. I'm starving. The sorting of the new students into houses took place at the start of every school year. But by an unlucky combination of circumstances, Harry hadn't been present at one since his own. He was quite looking forward to it. Just then, a highly excited, breathless voice called down the table. Hi, Harry. It was Colin Creevy, a third year to whom Harry was something of a hero. Hi, Colin, said Harry wearily. Oh, wearily. Harry, guess what? Guess what, Harry? My brother's starting. My brother, Dennis. Uh, good, said Harry. He's really excited, said Colin particularly bouncing up and down in his seat. I just hope it's in Gryffindor. Keep your fingers crossed, eh, Harry? Uh, yeah, all right, said Harry. He turned back to Hermione, Ron, and nearly headless Nick. Brothers and sisters usually go into the same houses, do they? He said. He was judging by the Weasleys, all seven of whom had been put into Gryffindor. No, not necessarily. Oh no, not necessarily," said Hermione. Parvati Patil's twins in Ravenclaw, and they're identical. You'd think they'd be together, wouldn't you? Harry looked up at the staff table. There seemed to be rather more empty seats than there than usual. Hagrid, of course, was still fighting his way across the lake with the first years. Professor McGonagall was presumably supervising the drying of the entrance hall floor. But there was another empty chair too, and he couldn't think of who else was missing. He couldn't think who else was missing. Where's the new Defence Against the Dark Arts teacher? said Hermione, who was also looking up at the teachers. They had never had a Defence Against the Dark Arts teacher who had lasted more than three terms. Harry's favourite by far had been Professor Lupin, who had resigned last year. He looked up and down the staff table. There was definitely no new face there. Maybe they couldn't get anyone, said Hermione, looking anxious. Harry scanned the table more carefully. Tiny little Professor Flitwick, the charms teacher, was sitting on a large pile of cushions beside Professor Sprout, the herbology teacher, whose hat was askew over her flyaway grey hair. She was talking to Professor Sinistra the ast of the astronomy department. On Professor Sinistra's other side was the sallow-faced, hooked-nosed, greasy-haired potions master Snape. Harry's least favourite person at Hogwarts. Harry's loathing of Snape was matched only by Snape's hatred of him. A hatred which had, if possible, intensified last year, when Harry had held Sirius escape right under Snape's overlarge nose. Snape and Sirius had been enemies since their own school days. On Snape's other side was an empty seat, which Harry guessed was Professor McGonagall's. Next to it, and in the very centre of the table, sat Professor McGonagall, sorry, sat Professor Dumbledore, the headmaster, his sweeping silver hair and beard shining in the candlelight, his magnificent deep green robes embroidered with many stars and moons. The tips of Dumbledore's long thin fingers were together, and he was resting his chin upon them, staring up at the ceiling through his half-moon spectacles, as though lost in thought. Harry glanced up at the ceiling too. It was enchanted to look like the night out, to look like the sky outside, and he had never seen it look this stormy. Black and purple clouds were swirling across it, and as another thunderclap sounded outside, a fork of lightning flashed across it. Oh, hurry up, Ron moaned, beside Harry. I could eat a hippogriff. The words were no sooner out of his mouth 
Then the doors of the great hall opened, and silence fell. Professor McGonagall was leading a long line of first years up to the top of the hall. If Harry, Ron and Hermione were wet, it was nothing to how the first years looked. They appeared to have swum across the lake rather than sailing. All of them were shivering with a combination of cold and nerves as they filed along the staff table and came to a halt in a line facing the rest of the school. All of them except the smallest of the lot, a boy with mousy hair, who was wrapped in what Harry recognised as Hagrid's moleskin overcoat. The coat was so big for him that it looked as though he was draped in a furry black marquee. His small face protruded from over the collar, looking almost painfully excited. When he had lined up with his terrified looking peers, he caught Colin Creevy's eye, gave a double thumbs up and mouthed, I fell in the lake. He looked positively delighted about it. Professor McGonagall now placed a three-legged stool on the ground before the first years and on top of it an extremely old, dirty-patched wizard's hat. The first years stared at it. So did everyone else. For a moment there was silence. Then a tear near the brim opened wide like a mouth. And the hat broke into song. A thousand years or more ago, when I was newly sown, there lived four wizards of renown, whose names are still well known. Bald Gryffindor from Wild Moor, Bear Ravenclaw from Glen, Sweet Hufflepuff from Valley Broad, Shrewd Slytherin from Fen. They shared a wish, a hope, a dream. They hatched a daring plan to educate young sorcerers, thus Hogwarts school began. Now each of these four founders formed their own house, for each they value different virtues in the ones they had to teach. By Gryffindor the bravest were prized far beyond the rest, for Ravenclaw the cleverest would always be the best. For Hufflepuff half-workers were most worthy of admission, and power-hungry Slytherin loved those of great ambition. While still alive, they did divide their favourites from the throng. Yet how to pick the worthy ones when they were dead and gone? T'was Gryffindor who found the way. He whipped me off his head. The founders put some brains in me, so I could choose instead. Now slip me snug about your ears. I've never yet been wrong. And have a look in, I'll have a look inside your mind and tell you where you belong. The great hall rang with applause as the sorting hat finished. That's not the song it sang when it sorted us, said Harry, clapping along with everyone else. Things are different one every year, said Ron. It's got to be a pretty boring life, hasn't it, being a hat? I suppose it spends all year making up the next one. Professor McGonagall was now unrolling a large scroll of parchment when I call your name, you will put on the hat and sit on the stool, she told the first years. When the hat announces your house, you will go and sit at the appropriate table. Ackerley Stewart. A boy walked forward, visibly trembling from head to foot, picked up the sorting hat, put it on and sat down on the stool. Ravenclaw! Said the, shouted the hat. Stuart Ackerley took off the hat and hurried into a seat at the Ravenclaw table, where everyone was applauding him. Harry caught a glimpse of Cho, the Ravenclaw seeker, cheering Stuart Ackley as he sat down. For a fleeting second, Harry had a strange desire to join the Ravenclaw table too. Baddock, Malcolm, Slytherin! The table on the other side of the hall erupted with cheers. Harry could see Malfoy clapping as Baddock joined the Slytherins. Harry wondered whether Baddock knew that Slytherin House had turned out more dark wizards than any other. Fred and George hissed Malcolm Baddock as he sat down. Branstone Eleanor! Hufflepuff! 
Caldwell Owen, Hufflepuff, Grievy Dennis, Tiny Dennis Grievy staggered forward, tripping over Hagrid's moleskin, just as Hagrid himself sidled into the hall, through a door behind the teacher's table, about twice as tall as a normal man, and at least three times as broad, Hagrid, with his long, wild, tangled black hair and beard, looked slightly alarming, a misleading impression, for Harry, Ron and Hermione knew Hagrid to possess a very kind nature. He winked at them as he sat down at the end of the staff table, and watched Dennis Creevy putting on the sorting hat, a rip in the brim open wide. Gryffindor! The hat shouted. Hagrid clapped along with the Gryffindors as Dennis Creevy, beaming widely, took off the hat, placed it back on the stool, and hurried over to join his brother. Carly and I fell in, he said shrilly, throwing himself into an empty seat. It was brilliant, and something in the water grabbed me and pushed me back in the boat. Cool, said Colin just as excitedly. It was probably the giant squid, Dennis. Wow, said Dennis as though nobody in their wildest dreams could hope for more than being thrown into a storm-tossed, fathom-steep lake and pushed out of it again by a giant sea, uh, sea monster, by a giant sea monster. Dennis, Dennis, see that boy down there, the one with the black hair and glasses? See him? Know who he is, Dennis? Harry looked away, staring very hard at the sorting hat, now sorting Emma Dobbs. The sorting continued, boys and girls with varying degrees of fright on their faces, moving one by one to the three-legged stool, the line dwindling slowly as Professor McGonagall passed the owls. Oh, hurry up, Ron moaned, massaging his stomach. Now, Ron, the sorting's much more important than food, See, nearly headless, said nearly headless Nick as madly Laura became a Hufflepuff. Of course it is if you're dead, said Ron. That snapped Ron. I do hope this year's batch of Gryffindors are up to scratch, said nearly headless Nick, applauding as MacDonald and Natalie joined the Gryffindor table. We don't want to break our winning streak, do we? Gryffindor have won the Interhouse Championship for the last three years in a row. Pritchard Graham, no, Pritchard Graham, Slytherin, Quirk Orla, Ravenclaw, and finally Whitby Kevin, Hufflepuff. The sorting ended. Professor McGonagall picked up the hat and the stool and carried them away. About time, said Ron, seizing his knife and fork and looking expectantly at his golden plate. Professor Dumbledore had got to his feet. He was smiling around at the students. His arms opened wide in welcome. I have only two words to say to you, he told them, his deep voice echoing around the hall. Tuck in! Hear, hear, said Harry and Ron loudly, as the empty dishes filled magically before their eyes. Nearly headless Nick watched mournfully as Harry, Ron and Hermione loaded their plates. Ah, oh, that's better! said Ron with his mouth full of mashed potato. You're lucky there's a feast at all tonight, you know, said nearly headless Nick. There was trouble in the kitchens earlier. Why, what happened, said Harry, for a sizable chunk of steak. Peeves, of course, said nearly headless Nick, shaking his head, which wobbled dangerously. He pulled his ruff a little higher up his neck. The usual arrangement the usual argument, you know. He wanted to attend the feast. Well, it's quite out of the question, you know, what he's like. Utterly uncivilised, can't see a plate of food without throwing it. We heard a ghost council. The fat fire was all for giving him the chance. But most wisely, in my opinion, the bloody baron put his foot down. The bloody baron was the slithering ghost a gaunt and silent spectre covered in silver bloodstains. He was the only person at Hogwarts who could really control Peeves. Yeah, we thought Peeves seemed hacked off about something, said Ron darkly, 
So what did he do in the kitchens? Oh, the usual, said nearly headless Nick, shrugging. Wreaked havoc and mayhem, pots and pans everywhere, placed swimming in soup, terrified the house elves out of their wits. Clang. Hermione had knocked over her golden goblet. Pumpkin juice spread steadily across the tablecloth, staining several feet of white linen orange. But Hermione paid no attention. There are house elves here, she said, staring horror-struck at nearly headless Nick. Here at Hogwarts? Certainly, said nearly headless Nick, looking surprised at her reaction. The largest number in any dwelling in Britain, I believe. Over a hundred. I've never seen one, said Hermione. Well, they hardly leave the kitchen by day, do they, said nearly headless Nick. They come out at night and do a bit of cleaning. See to the, see to the fires and so on. I mean, you're not supposed to see them, are you? That's a mark of a good house elf, isn't it? That you don't know that, that you don't know it's there. Hermione stared at him. But they get paid, she said. They get holidays, don't they? And, and sick leave and pensions and everything. Nearly headless Nick chortled so much that his ruff slipped and his head flopped off, dangling on the inch or so of his ghostly skin and muscle. Not of ghostly skin and muscle that still attached it to his neck. Sick leave and pensions, he said, pushing his head back onto his shoulders and securing it at once with his ruff. House elves don't want sick leave and pensions. Hermione looked down at her hardly touched plate of food, then put her knife and fork down upon it and pushed it away. Oh, come on, Hermione, said Ron, accidentally spraying. Harry with his Yorkshire pudding, with bits of Yorkshire pudding. Oops, sorry, Harry. He swallowed. You won't get them sickly by starving yourself. Slave labour, said Hermione, breathing hard through her nose. That's what made this dinner, slave labour. Then she refused to eat another bite. The rain was still drumming heavily against the high dark windows. Another clap of thunder shook the windows, and the stormy ceiling flashed, illuminating the golden place as the remains of the first course vanished and were replaced instantly with puddings. Treacle tar, Hermione, said Ron deliberately, wafting its smell towards her. Spotted dick, look, chocolate gatto. But Hermione gave him a look of rem so reminiscent of Professor McGonagall that he gave up. When the puddings too have been demolished and the last crumbs have faded off the plates, leaving them sparkling clean, Albus Dumbledore got to his feet again. The buzz of chatter filling the hall ceased almost at once, so that the only so that only the howling of the wind and pounding rain could be heard. So, said Professor Madonna at Dumbledore, smiling around at them. Now that we're all fed and watered <laughs> said Hermione, I must once more ask for your attention while I give out a few notices. Mr. Filch, the caretaker, has asked me to tell you that the list of objects forbidden inside the castle has this year been extended to include screaming yo-yos, fanged frisbees, and eye-bashing boomerangs. The full list comprises some 437 items, I believe, and can be viewed in Mr. Filch's office, if anybody would like to check it. The corners of Dumbledore's mouth twitched, he continued. As ever, I would like to remind you all that the forest in the ground is out of bounds to students, as is the village of Hogsmeade to all below third year. It is also my painful duty to inform you that the Interhouse Quidditch Cup will not take place this year. What? Harry gasped. He looked around at Fred and George, his fellow members of the Gryffindor team. They were mouthing soundlessly at Dumbledore, apparently too appalled to speak. Dumbledore continued, This is due to an event that will be starting in October 
and continuing throughout the school year, taking up much of the teacher's time and energy. But I am sure you will all enjoy it immensely. I have great pleasure in announcing that this year at Hogwarts, but at that moment there was a deafening rumble of thunder and the doors of the Great Hall banged open. A small man in the doorway, leaning upon a long staff, shrouded in a black travelling cloak. Every head in the Great Hall swivelled towards the stranger, suddenly brightly illuminated by a fork of lightning that flashed across the ceiling. He lowered his hood, shook out a long mane of grizzled dark grey hair, then began to walk up towards the teacher's table. A dull clunk echoed through the hall on his every other step. He reached the end of the top table, turned right and limped heavily towards Dumbledore. Another flash of lightning crossed the ceiling. Hermione gasped. The lightning had thrown the man's face into sharp relief, and it was a face unlike any Harry had ever seen. It looked as though it had been carved out of weathered wood by someone who had only the vaguest idea of what human faces were supposed to look like, and was none too skilled with a chisel. Every inch of skin seemed to be scarred. The mouth looked like, looked like a diagonal gash, and a large chunk of his nose was missing. And a large chunk of the nose was missing, sorry. But it was the man's eyes that made him frightening. One of them was small, dark and beady. The other was large, round as a coin, and a vivid electric blue. The blue eye was moving ceaselessly, without blinking, and was rolling up and down from side to side, quite independently of the normal eye. And then it rolled right over, pointing into the back of the man's head, so that all they could see was whiteness. The stranger reached Dumbledore. He stretched out a hand that was boldly scarred as his face, as that, that was as badly scarred as his face. But Dumbledore shook it, muttering words Harry couldn't hear. He seemed to be making some inquiry of the stranger, who shook his head unsmilingly and replied in an undertone, Dumbledore, Dumbledore nodded and gestured the man to the empty seat at his right hand side. The stranger sat down, shook his mane of dark grey hair out of his face, pulled a plate of sausages towards him, raised it into what was left of his nose and sniffed it. He then took a small knife out of his pocket, speared a sausage on the end of it and began to eat. His normal eye was fixed upon the sausages but the blue eye was still darting restlessly around in its socket, taking in the hall and the students. May I introduce our new Defence Against the Dark Arts teacher, said Dumbledore brightly, into the silence, Professor Moody. It was usual for the new staff members to be greeted with applause, but none of the staff or students clapped except Dumbledore and Hagrid. They both put their hands together and applauded, but the sound echoed dismally into the silence, and they stopped fairly quickly. Everyone else seemed too transfixed by Moody's bizarre appearance to do more than stare at him. Moody? Harry muttered to Ron. Mad-Eye Moody? The one your dad went to help this morning? Must be, said Ron in a low, awed voice. What happened to What happened to him? Hermione whispered. What happened to his face? Dunno, Ron whispered back, watching Moody with fascination. Moody seemed totally indifferent to his less than warm welcome, ignoring the jug of pumpkin juice in front of him. He reached again into his travelling cloak, pulled out a hip flask, and took a long draught from it. 
as he lifted his arm to drink his cloak was pulled a few inches from the ground and Harry saw below the table several inches of carved wooden leg ending in a clawed fur. Dumbledore cleared his throat again. As I was saying, he said, smiling at the seer students before him, all of whom were still gazing transfixed at mad Moody. We are to have the honour of hosting a very exciting event over the coming months, an event which has not been held for over a century. It is my great pleasure to inform you that the Tri-Wizard Tournament will be taking place at Hogwarts this year. You're joking, said Fred Weasley loudly. The tension that have filled the hall ever since Moody's arrival suddenly broke. Nearly everyone laughed, and Dumbledore chuckled appreciatively. I am not joking, Mr. Weasley, he said. Though now you mention it, I did hear an excellent one over the summer about a troll, a hag and a leprechaun, who all went into a bar. Professor McGonagall cleared her throat loudly. Uh, but maybe this is not the time. No, said Dumbledore. Where was I? Ah, yes. The Tri-Wizard Tournament. Well, some of you will not know what this tournament involves, so I hope those who do will forgive me for giving a short explanation and allow their attention to wander freely. The Tri-Wizard Tournament was first established some 700 years ago as a friendly competition between the three largest European schools of wizardry, Hogwarts, Bowbatons and Durmstrang. A champion was selected to represent each school, and the three champions competed in three magical tasks. The schools took it in turns to host the tournament once every five years, and it was generally agreed to be a most excellent way of establishing ties between young witches and wizards of different nationalities, until that is the death toll. Mounted so high that the tournament was discontinued. Death toll, Hermione whispered, looking alarmed, but her anxiety did not seem to be shared by the majority of students in the hall. Many of them were whispering excitedly with each other, and Harry himself was far more interested in hearing more about the tournament than in worrying about deaths that had happened hundreds of years ago. There have been several attempts over the, con over the centuries to reinstate the tournament, Dumbledore continued, none of which have been successful. However, our own departments of international magical cooperation and magical games and sports have decided the time is right for another attempt. We have worked hard over the summer to ensure that this time no champion will find himself or herself in mortal danger. The heads of Bow Battens and Durmstrang will be arriving with their shortlisted contenders in October, and the selection of the three champions will take place at Halloween. An impartial judge will decide which students are most worthy to compete for the Tri Wizard Cup, the glory of their school, and a thousand galleons personal prize money. I'm going for it, Fred Weasley hissed down the table. His face lit with enthusiasm at the prospect of such glory and riches. He was not the only person who seemed to be visually uh, visualising himself as Hogwarts champion. At every house table, Harry could see people either gazing raptly at Dumbledore or else whispering fervently to their neighbours. But then Dumbledore spoke again, and the hall quietened once more. Eager though I know all of you will be to bring the Triwizard Cup to Hogwarts, he said. The heads of the participating schools, along with the Ministry of Magic, have agreed to impose an age restriction on contenders this year. Only students who are of age, that is to say, 17 years or older, will be allowed to put forward their names. For consideration, this 
Dumbledore raised his voice slightly over the several people have no, for several people have made noises of outrage at these words. And the Weasley twins were suddenly looking furious. Is a measure we feel is necessary, given that the tournament tasks will be difficult and dangerous, whatever precautions we take, and it is highly unlikely that students below sixth and seventh year will be able to cope with them. I will personally be ensuring that no underage student hoodwinks our impartial judge into making them Hogwarts champion. His light blue eyes twinkled as they flickered over Fred and George's mutinous faces. I therefore beg you not to waste your time submitting yourself if you are under 17. The delegations from Bow Battens and Durmstrang will be arriving in October and remaining with us for the greater part of this year. I know that you will all extend every courtesy to our foreign guests while they are with us, and will give your wholehearted support to the Hogwarts champion when he or she is selected. And now, it is late and I know how important it is to you all to be alert and rested as you enter your lessons tomorrow morning. Bedtime! Chop chop! Dumbledore sat down again and turned to talk to Mad-Eye Moody. There was a great scraping and banging as all the students got to their feet and swarmed towards the double doors into the entrance hall. They can't do that, said George Weasley, who had not joined the crowd moving towards the door, but was standing up glaring at Dumbledore. We're 17 in April. Why can't we have a shot? They're not stopping me entering, said Fred stubbornly, also scowling at the top table. The champions will get to do all sorts of stuff you'd never be allowed to do normally. And a thousand galleons prize money? Yeah, said Ron, a faraway look on his face. Yeah, a thousand galleons. Come on, said Hermione. We'll be the only ones left here if you don't move. Harry, Ron, Hermione, Fred and George set off for the... Entrance Hall. Fred and George debating the ways in which Dumbledore might stop those who were under 17 entering the tournament. Who's this impartial judge who's going to decide who the champions are, said Harry. Dunno, said Fred. But it's them we'll have to fool. I reckon a couple of drops of aging potion might do it, George. Dumbledore knows you're not of age, said... Uh, Dumbledore knows you're not of age, though, said Ron. Yeah, but he's not the one who decides who the champion is, is he? Said Fred shrewdly. Sounds to me like once this judge knows who wants to enter, he'll choose the best from each school and never mind how old they are. Dumbledore's trying to stop us giving our names. People have died, though, said Hermione in a worried voice as they walked through a door concealed behind a tapestry and started up another narrower staircase. Yeah, said Fred airily, but that was years ago, wasn't it? Anyway, where's the, any, anyway, where's the fun without a bit of risk? Hey Ron, what if we find out how to get round Dumbledore? Fancy entering? What do you reckon? Ron asked Harry. Be cool to enter, wouldn't it? But I suppose but I suppose they might want someone older. Don't know if we learnt enough. I definitely haven't, came Neville's gloomy voice from behind Fred and George. I expect my grandma want me to try though. She's always going on about how I should be upholding my family honour. I'll just have to oops, Neville's foot had sunk right through a step halfway up the staircase. There were many of these trick stairs at Hogwarts. It was second nature to most of the older students to jump this particular step, but Neville's memory was notoriously poor. Harry and Ron seized him under the armpits 
and pulled him out, while a suit of armour at the top of the stairs creaked and clanked, laughing wheezily. Shut it, you, said Ron, banging down his visor and as they pass. They made their way up to the entrance to Gryffindor Tower, which was concealed behind a large portrait of a fat lady in a pink silk dress. Password, she said, as they approached. Balderdash, said George, a prefect downstairs told me. The portrait swung forwards to reveal a hole in the wall, through which they all climbed. A crackling fire was warming the circular common room which was full of squashy armchairs and tables. Hermione cast a merrily, cast a merrily dancing flames a dark look, and Harry distinctly heard her mutter, Slave labour, before bidding them good night and disappearing through the doorway to the girls' dormitories. Harry, Ron and Neville climbed up the last spiral staircase until they reached their own dormitory which was situated at the top of the tower. Five four-poster beds with deep crimson hangings stood against the walls, each with its owner's trunk at the foot. Dean and Seamus were already getting into bed. Seamus had pinned his island rosette to his headboard, and Dean had tacked up a poster of Victor Crumb over his bedside table. His old poster of West Ham football team was pinned right next to it. Mental, Ron sighed, shaking his head at the completely stationary soccer players. Harry, Ron and Neville got into their pyjamas and into bed. Someone, a house elf no doubt, had placed the warming pans between, had placed warming pans between the sheets. It was extremely comfortable lying there in bed and listening to the storm raging outside. I might go in for it, you know, Ron said sleepily through the darkness. If Fred and George find out how to, the tournament, you never know, do you? Suppose not. Harry rolled over in bed, a series of dazzling new pictures forming in his mind's eye. He had hoodwinked the impartial judge into believing he was 17. He had become Hogwarts champion. He was standing in the grounds his arms raised in triumph in front of the whole school. All of whom were applauding and screaming. He had just won the Triwizard Tournament. Joe's face stood out particularly clearly in the blurred crowd, her face glowing with admiration. Harry grinned into his pillow exceptionally, glad that Ron couldn't see what he could. And that was chapter 12 of Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. Next time, chapter 13, Mad-Eye Moody. Until then, bye-bye.